Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where your current location is. And a warm welcome to today's webinar on the highly topical issue of 5G technology, cybersecurity, and its possible ramifications. First, of course, I would like to welcome our two, uh, our main speaker of today, uh, Brigadier General Choi, and also Lieutenant General Chun, who will be commenting on General Choi's presentations. Great to have you both on board. And also a sincere welcome to our online viewers. We do hope this webinar will be an interesting session and I encourage our viewers to ask questions using the Q&A function described by EBA. Most developed countries in the world today are introducing or planning to introduce 5G technology. Along the many benefit of this new technology is also raising awareness that this new technology may be accompanied with some far-reaching and serious security concerns. One such concern is over the huge impact of interconnectivity this new technology will have from smart homes, self-driving cars, healthcare, and the entire commercial sector, as well as the choice of business partners when we introduce our 5G technology. In Sweden currently, as many of you know, uh, the discussion is ongoing as we are in the process of deciding who will take part in building our new 5G network. South Korea is a highly developed country and maybe the most connected nation in the world today. And with some of the most respected and well-known telecommunications companies like Samsung and LG. It is also a country with plenty of experience from various kinds of malicious cyber operations. So can we learn anything from the South Korean experience? This webinar is focused on cybersecurity, 5G and related issues in the Republic of Korea, including possible implications for military operations. To talk about these issues today, I'm very delighted to introduce to you Brigadier General Choi nag Brigadier General Choi is a professor in cyber warfare at the National, Korea National Defense University. He has extensive experience from both the practical aspect of cyber, cyber warfare and communication system as a military officer, and likewise from a more theoretical and research background. During his military career, he has mostly served in communications, signals and cyber appointment. He has commanded the Signals Brigade in South Korea and studied computer science at the Korea Military Academy and telecommunication system management at the US Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. His current research interest is on cybersecurity and combining cyberspace technologies and military operations. If I would summarize in one word, a true expert in the field of cybersecurity. So please, sir, the word is yours. Thank you, General. Let me start with sharing my screen. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Nak Jung Choi, retired Brigadier General of the Republic of Korea. As General Engman introduced, currently I am a cyber warfare professor for master's degree students at the Korean National Defense University. Today's presentation on Korea's 5G uh, cybersecurity strategy. My presentation is based on 30 years of a military life and my experience as the director of a command, communication, and cyber, RAPKCS, and subsequent some research on 5G. When I was a young officer, my senior officers always said, make reports simple and easy. If your children can read, the, read and understand that report, understand that report is the best. I did my best to make it simple and easy, but decision is yours. Since English is not my first language, please do not try to understand everything I say. However, I'm sure to finish my presentation on time. 
My presentation consists of four chapters. I will start with the presentation on the importance of IT infrastructure and proceed to Korea's 5G strategy, cybersecurity concerns, and recommendations. Mm -hmm. Although these are my own personal opinions, but they are based on relevant research and facts. The importance of IT infrastructure. On November 24, 2018 at 11, 12 a.m., a fire broke out in the underground cable tunnel of Korea Telecom, Seoul, and several hundred thousand communication failure occurred. The fire burned 169,000 copper wires and 225 optic cables, and it took 11 days to restore all cables and services. The results were tremendous. About 17% of the Seoul metropolitan area was influenced. Internet and telephone networks were down, and all services using those networks were down too, as you see on the slide. At the time, I was the commander of a Defense Communication Command, which supports general communication services to the Ministry of Defense, JCS, and other major commands. Some of my responsible services were down too. Those services include gateway to the civil telephone networks and the networks for the CFI systems. We learned two things in this accident. The first is how fragile the communication infrastructure is. And the second is how much we depend on the internet. The next case is the 2018 Winter Olympic uh, cyber attack. The attack began at 8 p.m. on March 9, the exact time when the opening ceremony began. 50 servers out of 300 were destroyed, which led to the crashing of a 44 Olympic game management systems. Eight communication services, including IPTV and Wi-Fi, were also stopped. Recovery priority was given to critical services, including Wi-Fi and IPTV, for opening hall and main press center, which were needed after the opening ceremony. Antivirus signature was created and started to vaccinate at 5 p.m. a.m. Finally, all services were recovered at 8 a.m. within 12 hours after the attack. Hackers were identified this October by both U.S. and U.K. as shown on slide. Two lessons can be found in this cyber attack. First, the importance of securing resilience. Recovering complex Olympic supporting system within 12 hours was possible due to those repeated simulated training. Second, the way the attacker used means of uh, technical and psychological measures to conceal the origin of the attack may invoke conflicts between nations. A research predicting the cable tunnel fire incident was published by the Science and Technology Policy Institute in 2012. The report analyzed the situation of X event where the internet was paralyzed by five scenarios. The five scenarios include cyber terrorism, physical attack, power grid blackouts, human accidents, and the combination of a thereof. The complex scenario was the worst and would last seven days to recover. The study emphasized that the second and third chain reaction would affect all nation function, national functions. This study was published eight years ago 
but is effective still now. With the innovative development of IoT technology, its impact will be difficult to imagine in the future. The communication infrastructure is like air and water. Like an iceberg, it is very difficult to understand the hidden part of the internet. We recognize the importance of the IT infrastructure only when the cable tunnel fire like instant happens. Another characteristic is that IT systems become increasingly complex and the impact of damage becomes difficult to predict. 5G is taking on form of a high-speed LTE plus IoT. The influence of 5G embedded in home appliance, vehicles, factories, and weapon system is hard to, hard to imagine. These cyber threats to 5G will affect all the sovereignty of a country and will affect independent, independent decision making. Now let's take a look at it, Korea's 5G strategy. The Korean government announced 5G plus strategy for realizing innovative growth in April 2019. The strategy is creating first move type industries and the services through 5G based digital transformation and intelligent innovation. The detailed plan include 10 5G core industries, category of equipment, terminal, uh, yes, device, security, and five core services including reality, con reality contents, smart factory, autonomous vehicle, smart city, and digital healthcare. The plan is based on creating a safe 5G environment, including cybersecurity and physically strong communication infrastructure. Currently, Korea's mobile communication networks are a mixture of 3G, uh, 4G LTE, and 5G. The main network's LTE and 5G is expanding its scope. Korea's 5G service started on 2300 April 3, 2019, which is the first in the world two hours earlier than USA. Three mobile carriers provide services through their respective networks and the 5G service coverage is provided as shown in red on the slide. The rate of deployment of 5G base station is 13.5% nationally compared to 4G stations as of August 2020. LG U Plus offers the widest coverage, but it has a dilemma due to the use of Huawei equipment. military utilizations. The reasons for the military use of mobile communications are many, but I would pick three reasons. First, smartphone tamed soldiers. There is no need to train soldiers how to use smartphone terminals. Second, lack of frequency assets. There are increasing number of weapon systems using frequencies. In addition to that, the civilian sectors also require more frequencies for internet, mobile communications, smart cities, and so on. Third, rapid deployment of unmanned systems. They require a wide range of bandwidths for controlling and sensor information, including high quality videos. With this background, the Korean military utilized the commercial and military mobile communications for a long time. Currently, 
Army Tactical Mobile Communication Systems are being deployed. Three corps out of eight already have these systems. It's wiper based mil-spec system supporting secret level communications. Another Army application is the helicopter tracking systems used by Army Aviation Command. It utilizes a commercial LT network with cross-domain solution for security. Air Force application is the base support system. It's a military-only frequency and the terminal LT systems. The government's 5G plus strategy stimulated the military side too. The Army will use 5G technology as a network for the intelligent platforms through smart unit plans. A pilot plan was initiated. One regiment level pilot project will be started next year. And one division level pilot project will be conducted from uh, 2022 to 23. The Navy is working on a smart ship project. A project to build an LT network on DDH class combat ship is underway this year. The Air Force is promoting a project to build a smart base by upgrading and expanding the existing base support system. 5G will be used in various fields, such as command and control, air traffic control, and the maintenance. The expansion of mobile communications in the military raises concern about cyber attacks on 5G networks. If 5G networks are subjected to cyber attack, they will have a direct and serious blow to the military operations and national defense. Now let's take a look at some of the security concerns related to these developments. My major was a computer science at the Korea Military Academy, and I did ADA programming in the master, deg master degrees course on telecommunication system management at the US Naval Post Graduate School. According to this, my experience, there are few software without errors. An example would be a number of window patches. The technology trend is that software replaced the role of the existing hardware. The 5G network will be configured and managed by applying software defined network technology, SDN. 5G's dynamic software-based system have far more traffic routing points, which led to any unsecured areas. When the NFV network functions virtualization concept is implemented, the network and security systems that had been composed of hardware would be converted into software modules and installed in standard NFP hardware. As software replaces the functions previously performed by hardware, the proportion of software increases, and accordingly, the probability of a software error increases. FPGA is a field programmable gate array. It is an integrated circuit that can be reprogrammed. Some network system companies use FPGA chips for fast developing cycles and the flexibility, which may lead to malicious modification of network devices. Those SDN, NFV, and FPGA technologies will expose vulnerability to cyber attacks. 5G systems rely heavily on software updates provided by vendors. So it is possible for them to inject malicious coders. Resident support and remote access support from equipment companies also are a weak point for cyber attack. 
it is almost impossible to verify the backdoor by a telecommunication company, but the equipment supplier can. Most importantly, the fear is great because backdoors are the future threat that can be planted at any time, if not now. Besides software issues, there are three more weak points. One of five disadvantages is short delay. To make that happen, some functions of the core network are integrated into the edge part of the network, which make the equipment sensitive. This will widen the attack surface and increase the number of intrusion points. The attack surface is widened by IoT connections. I have a Wi-Fi connected washing machine, which reports to me via smartphone. IoT means refrigerators, speakers, and even a thermometer for a fish tank. A lack of a security standard for IoT devices means network breaches. Lastly, high-speed networks. Current networks are limited in speed. This has actually helped providers monitor security in real time. But 5G's high speed has the potential to strain current security monitoring and hot cyber security. <clears throat> now we are in very sensitive area. What's the concern with Huawei? After I search reports and papers on this issue, I concluded on three points. First, bad deeds in the past. Huawei is responsible for the backdoor case on Vodafone Italy in 2011, and the same backdoor cases on the US smartphone in 2016. Also in February, a White House official says Huawei has a secret backdoor. Second, China's internet safety law. According to this law, if the Chinese government requests information, private companies cannot refuse. Also, the ambiguous nature of the law allows the Chinese government more space to request or control information. Lastly, equipment supply in the future. On August 17, 2020, the Bureau of Industry and Security of the United States issued the Export Administration Regulation, EAR, to further respond to the ongoing threat posed by Huawei and overseas affiliates to national security and foreign policy interests. Therefore, if Huawei cannot find a solution within a few months, when the previously secured semiconductor inventory is exhausted, it is expected that a major change will occur in the smartphone and 5G equipment. Recommendations. Let me first summarize. The risk with IoT added uh, 5G system will be a threat to national sovereignty and create a direct and serious impact on military operations. The vulnerability of a 5G system comes from software characteristics of a device and systems, increased attack surface because of edge computing and IoT terminals, and constrained security monitoring. My recommendations. First, select vendors which have a democratic decision-making processes. In 2013, I was a J6 planning branch chief of a J6 Rock JCS, and was leading a smartphone utilization project. We request the support to smartphone companies for help. The response was 300,000 terminals. That number was the minimum unit required for software version control. Would it be possible if Rock's KCIA asked Samsung for backdoors? The answer is, I think, no. 
they care more about the company and the stockholders interest we need to select a company so a transparent decision making process which offer information to the public second legal regulation and criminalization laws restrict criminal activities and the serious punishment makes the criminal decision even more difficult and the name and shame strategy was very effective in many international cases finally resilience as we see in the case of a pyeongchang winter olympic cyber attack defending complex system from cyber attack is very difficult and sometimes it's almost impossible to keep our network running we need to strengthen the cyber defense posture and the build up resilience that's all i have thank you very much i look forward to your comments and questions Thank you very, very much, uh, Brigadier General Choi, for uh, giving us such a comprehensive, in-depth uh, analysis and description of uh, the South Korean cybersecurity strategy. I, I must say that uh, you managed to move from the very technical aspects of this issue and explain it uh, in a kind of practical consequences uh, of uh, what may be the consequences. Uh, before we move to our discussion session, I would like to invite uh, Lieutenant General Chunin Boom to give a few comments. Uh, Lieutenant General Chunin Boom has held numerous <clears throat> commands and battalion regimental and division commands, as well as several key staff appointment. He has ex international experience from serving with the multinational force in Iraq and been deployed to Afghanistan. One of its most high profile appointments was being promoted to Lieutenant General and assigned as the commander of the ROC Special Warfare Command. His last military assignment was as the deputy commander for the first ROC Army and uh, Lieutenant General Chun retired from active duty in July 2016. After leaving active service, he has conducted several fellowships at Brookings, John Hopkins and Georgia Tech. He is currently the vice president for the Korean Freedom Federation and was recently, as Ebba said, a guest researcher here at ISTP in Stockholm. So please, sir, the word is yours. Mats, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I would just like to echo your comments and congratulating Brigadier General Retired Che for uh, giving us a very concise and practical overview of the challenges and threats that Korea faces uh, in the 5G arena. Although Korea should be congratulated by the fact that it has led the 5G effort, uh, it also means that Korea faces the initial challenges that comes with new technology. And I think uh, General Che has been successful in presenting even to a layman like myself uh, how serious the potential weaknesses are. For me, I think for the past 20 minutes, uh, what struck me was it's not just hackers, but now with 5G, not only comes with it benefits, but heightened dangers. For me as a layman, 5G means that machines are talking to machines and nobody really knows what these machines are talking to each other about. If there is a way that any entity, especially an entity that has a aspiration to control others, has a way of influencing this uh, exchange between machines and thereby influencing our lives, the consequences are severe indeed. So I think today's uh, webinar uh, will allow us to focus into this. The challenges that Korea faces now are going to be the challenges that the rest of the world will be facing in the future. And I think the mistakes or the things that the Koreans do right 
are some of the things that might be illuminative of what we can do in the future. So I hope that today's conference, uh, the Zoom meeting will be beneficial to all those uh, who are uh, attending. And again, I congratulate General Che for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, General Chun. Um, I also encourage our online viewers to ask questions now when we have such a imminent expert in the field available to us. Uh, but uh, let me first try to, to phrase what, what, what struck me listening to your presentation, General Che. Um, I mean, you come from a country and you represent a country and have experience from a country that is highly developed, has a sophisticated knowledge on the, the edge and key edge technology when it comes to 5G communications, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And you have the ability to both learn from um, incidents and handle incidents and take mitigating actions. But as this is rolled out worldwide, uh, and there may be malicious actors that will be part of the, the rollout and the billet, you will have a number of countries with less, call it competence and technological uh, capability to address these kind of issues. So have we reached a situation where there may be a balance tipping that makes the security concerns so grave that we need to slow or maybe even take a pause in uh, the rollout of 5G technology? So that's the question for me. Yes, please, hmm. if I may. <laughs> I think it's almost impossible to slow down the technology developments because each countries compete each other yeah. for uh, get to get initiative in these new technology areas because that's the power. So developed countries are competing each other, but un underdeveloped and the poor countries, they are in bad uh, condition. One example I read is that uh, uh, the African country, the China build up some buildings for them and uh, the building is like a hacking house. All the microphones and the internet connection and servers are uh, being controlled by the builders. That's China. And uh, this kind of uh, ethics and uh, good willing is needed for the developed country for underdeveloped countries. This we need to cooperate to protect from that actions. Okay, may I also try to, uh, a question to, to both of you, please? Um, I mean, obviously South Korea has for uh, its security, a high dependence on United States when it comes to nuclear deterrence, intel sharing, uh, forces deployed in South Korea and for any military contingency, you would plan for reinforcement to use military forces. And on the other hand, uh, for natural reasons, you are very dependent in the economic field by China, uh, your largest trading partner, uh, among other things. And we know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Jenna Chie, that um, the Chinese company Wei is, is one of the key um, entities, key companies, when it comes to uh, spearheading 5G technology. And if I understand it correctly, uh, some of the current uh, South Korean companies in the telecommunications sector use UAE products in their networks. So how do you strike a balance between the kind of hardline United, Nation, United States actions vis-a-vis -vis UAE and your economic dependence? Can you kind of balance the two and, and what, what is the is there right balance in order not to upset the Americans not to upset the Chinese 
Well, while the expert is thinking, uh, 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 the layman will be courageous <laughs> enough to yeah. uh, talk Thank first. You. So I think the South Koreans uh, did not realize how serious this backdoor issue was or was educated enough in the beginning uh, about the 5G technology, how 5G is uh, great, but at the same time, it has vulnerabilities. And because of this uh, unawareness, we focused on economics and because uh, Chinese products were cheaper and seemed as effective, we did not imagine that it would have malig malicious programming and backdoors uh, incorporated into it. Uh, recent reports said that some uh, approximately 250 uh, military cameras that were bought uh, with Chinese technology in it had uh, software built into it that would, al would have allowed these cameras uh, to be used as uh, information source for the Chinese. And heaven forbid that if these cameras could have connected to other military uh, devices, I mean, the implications would have been horrific, but we found out. Now that we know, it's not a matter of US versus China, but the security and the national interests of the Korean people of whether we can use uh, Chinese products if they are not guaranteed to be clean and safe. So I think uh, in my view, it is, it is a very simple matter. Now, in practical means, we do 40% of our business with the Chinese. And we need to be very polite, but at the same time, we need to be practical. And I fear that uh, it, the Chinese have brought this onto their own selves, but it's not just a Korean problem. The Chinese Huawei uh, company has a 30% market share of this technology throughout the world. And so, the, the African company that General Che just mentioned, what if that building is connected to a building in Seoul or, or in Stockholm? Mm -hmm. And what if through that building, it can connect not only to a building in Stockholm, but it's you know uh, connected to all the other buildings. So I think uh, China, the ball is in the Chinese court where they must guarantee that none of this uh, will happen again. But again, because of the past track record and the practices of the Chinese, the characteristics of the Chinese government, we can never be sure. And therefore uh, we have to be very careful of uh, using Chinese products, especially in this arena. That's my view. Thank you. Do you want to comment on this one, General Che? Yes, very, it's very difficult dealing with China and the United States. We are between them. And uh, I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'm kind of a, a technical background and uh, retired military officers. But uh, technically, uh, we can't, it's impossible to find out backdoors. Mm because on hardware if the suppliers insert uh, some code into the hardware it's almost impossible because currently we have a uh, uh, silicon layered 64 uh, layers of uh, the, uh, the electronic the panels and this kind of uh, hardware structure is, is impossible. Also, software. Uh, some Italian says they have a CC uh, authentication, but uh, we don't know. Next time, when that company vendors do patches, how we know the patches uh, malicious code or not. So 
it is almost impossible. So that's the reason why I recommend my three recommendations. Resilience is very important. Also, finding out some malicious action is important. Monitoring. If something happens, we need to know and everybody needs to know. So that's the name and shame make that situation and uh, all internationals blames for that actions. That is the way to protect the whole world, I think. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from one of our online viewers, uh, Ambassador Varia. Uh, uh, his question is, I'm really ignorant about this, but is it possible to create backdoors that in fact are traps into fake rooms where the hackers have to reveal themselves? Is that something for you, uh, General Che? Can we create yeah. such a backdoor? <clears throat> Yeah, and the cyber defense mechanism or technology, there is uh, some honeypot uh, technology, but uh, that is uh, the technology using uh, the honeypot is like a, a very uh, not real machine, but uh, look like a, a real and uh, attract the hackers into that honeypot and uh, watch them. That's the mechanism that Honeypot have, but uh, I'm not sure on the device we can have that kind of uh, measures. Okay, thank you. Leading into that, I'm, I'm, I have a background uh, from uh, the Swedish uh, Intelligence Security Service. Uh, and one of the things we were, were uh, talking about uh, and uh, trying to uh, take action against is what you call a sleeping agent somebody who is not doing anything but he or she is in your country and can be activated in case of crisis so what about having the kind of sleeping agent concept in uh, these kind of devices and as you mentioned uh, general chi uh, with 5g come an increase in vulnerabilities access points uh, connectivity uh, so would it be easier, do you say, to have a kind of digital sleeping agent uh, installed that you can activate once a crisis is, is escalating or when you want to escalate or initiate the crisis? Yes, this, I think there's a general measures for cyber attack. And uh, that's time bomb. Sometimes we call it the book. Okay. And uh, the hackers or the manufacturer of a device put some malicious code into the systems which yeah, others cannot find. And they are just there, sleep. And uh, there are so many measures, but uh, timestamp when the time comes it wake or some signals comes in it wakes mm -hmm. nowadays as i said the software characteristics they need patches they don't have to have that kind of a sleeping malicious code nowadays okay. when they need to patches they can insert into the initial device is very clean, perfect, but uh, later that can be contaminated later. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> still time for some questions for our online viewers, if you like to. Uh, but talking about South Korea, it's very difficult not to talk about North Korea. Um, and we know from reports that North Korea is investing uh, and have developed some rather sophisticated cyber warfare capabilities and are using this for both uh, political, economic and, and military uh, uh, motives. So how would you say, what, what have you learned from uh, dealing with the North Korean cyber threat? And is there something in particular that is, is, can characterize the North Korean cyber uh, activities? 
maybe both of you can answer if you like to. Uh, maybe over to you, uh, General Choi, first. Yes. Uh, I'm not that perfect professions for that uh, questions, but uh, the North Korean's <clears throat> main effort changed recently, and uh, they are focused on the economical side of uh, uh, cyber attack, and uh, they want to get uh, they want to get money by attacking banking systems and uh, uh, blockchain systems. And that's the trend. But uh, uh, also, one of the things yeah, good for us is that yeah, we are military. When we train, we get strong. In cyber world, we have a very uh, strong cyber forces over there. and. Uh, we have many chances to make our systems or make our people's training for that. So that experience helps us defending ourselves from in this cyber world. You would like to comment, uh, General Chun? Yes. So I've always termed North Korea as a cyber superpower. And the main reason is that their cyber hackers are state sponsored. What this means is that the state is able to pull in their best and brightest mathematicians at a very early age and start educating them. At a certain process in their education, they're divided into programmers and hackers. And they've used their technology to break into South Korean databases, uh, attack, you know, the banking system. And now they're doing cyber crime throughout the world. Um, one of the benefits that North Korea enjoys is that they are not bound by international laws or norms, mm. which allows them, again, freedom to act as they please. Now, as General Che has pointed out, that has given the South Koreans a lot of opportunity to practice, but I must admit at a great price. Again, like with so many North Korean issues, it's not just a South Korean problem. Uh, they're stealing from everyone and they can touch mostly everyone. Sony is a good example, mm -hmm. uh, other, other cyber, criminal uh, activities are abound that we know is from North Korea. Uh, because South Korea is going to 5G, I think we are in a more vulnerable situation and that despite the fact that it provides us with a good opportunity to practice, we will still be paying a price. So far, it's been mostly monetary uh, sacrifices that we've had to uh, endure but uh, you can never uh, exclude the fact that it could always turn into lives. I mean, frankly, they could crash a plane or you know, overheat a, 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 a generator. And uh, it, it, with 5G now, it makes it easier. And so uh, for us, the threat is uh, very close to our uh, daily lives. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, we have another question from one of our online viewers, Ms. Larissa Stickel. Uh, how should the South Korean government ideally tackle the various cybersecurity risks associated with 5G technology, especially against the backdrop of 5G technology being rolled out at a very fast pace? Maybe you can try to answer this, General Che. How should you tackle uh, the security concern with 5G? Apart from your recommendations, then maybe. Yes. If you have. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think the United States also have a, they have a change strategy for the cyber defense. Uh, <clears throat> in, 
in Korea, there is a saying that uh, 10 people cannot uh, protect from thieves entering to the house because defense is very difficult. In cyberspace, it's the same. Uh, defense, defense means lots of uh, <clears throat> uh, money, asset is needed, manpower and money and many other things. We build up our uh, defense uh, capability in need that assets. So they changed their uh, strategy, resilience. And uh, if there's a cyber attack, we rebuild it in quickly. So make our system running, continuously running. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a balance, protection and resilience and the survivability. That's the key, I think. Okay, thank you. In the end of your presentation, Dinochi, you mentioned uh, three basic recommendations. One was on, on the legal uh, side. And <clears throat> if I remember correctly, you mentioned international cooperation and name and shame. Uh, so what would you say is the, uh, the importance of international cooperation when it comes to cybersecurity? And, and what is the most call it, promising international efforts in this respect in order to, to learn and, and uh, learn from others and have a coherent international response? Uh, one of the international uh, cooperation is, as United States uh, did, reveal and uh, the hacking mechanism and the codes onto internet and share it. That measures, we stand measures, the hackers need to pay lots of uh, time and uh, money for that. Uh, that's the barriers for other uh, countries to try to uh, do criminal actions on cyberspace. So that's the, my little answers for that. Mm. Any comment on this one, Jun and Chun? I think as a consumer, as the cons customer of products, we have the right to ask the provider uh, to provide us with good products. Uh, right now, because of misdeeds by the producer uh, who has a large share of the market, we're in a difficult situation. So I think it's not just a US-China issue. It's a consumer and provider issue. And so it's upon the provider to guarantee that his product or her product is safe and clean to use. And so I feel that we need a united front so that uh, Korea is not standing alone or that Korea feels as if it's standing alone. Mm -hmm. So I think today's uh, meeting is important in that we highlight the fact that this problem that we have is not just a South Korean problem. South mm -hmm. Korea, because it has led the 5G effort is just feeling the first wave of the issues. And hopefully we will be able to learn from these activities and uh, the lessons so far. And I hope that uh, today's meeting and conference will uh, allow us to have another ally in this effort for the co uh, consumer to have the right to have better products and reliable products. Thank you very much. I think th that's, quite encouraging. I mean, maybe we as consumers, all of us, uh, both in, in, in South Korea and Sweden and elsewhere, can have an impact on this by demanding, like we do in many other products, we demand that the products are free from chemicals or it's been um, whatever it is. But the, the consumer power is, is rather very strong. So maybe that's an encouraging way forward. Um, 
I like to to have one final question, maybe to both of you, and that is, the whole world more or less has now been uh, suffering for almost a year with the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, so how has the experience so far has that kind of um, uh, initiated debate or discussion in, in, in South Korea about the utility and the opportunity and security aspects of 5G technology, or is it uh, two separate issues that doesn't connect? Well, if I may just give a breather to Brigadier General Che. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, I don't think we've we've been able to uh, fully understand the impact of COVID-19 upon uh, our daily lives. Uh, just, you know, a year ago, I did not know what Zoom or webinar was, but now I do. Yeah. And because I have 5G in my house, I'm able to uh, enjoy this uh, uh, virtual meeting. But at the same time, I know for a fact that I can, this technology can be used to eavesdrop and monitor my uh, activities. So COVID has enlightened us to new technologies and has forced us to give up our old habits. But I think the total impact of what 5G and COVID and all these things will bring to us in the final stage is still up for grabs. And unfortunately, my personal estimate for COVID ending anytime soon is, uh, is, is not that positive. So uh, we still have a struggle in front of us. Thank you, General Che. General Jones said- the pandemic uh, and how has that affected the discussion in, in, in your country? Yeah. Uh, I have a little idea on that issues, but uh, the 5G technology, the IoT systems, it will help us tracking the patients and the peoples. The technology also include the uh, uh, cloud computing, AI systems that we have uh, more tools to track and protect our society from the pandemics, I think. Thank you. If you allow, I have one more question from our online viewers from Ambassador Varya. Does South Korea educate enough students in cyber technology? What do you think, General Che? Do you have enough human capital? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> there is a no, uh, nothing is enough. No, <laughs> <What's> exactly. <that>? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, Korea, uh, milit especially military, we raised a very young and talented student for the cyber warfare and the cyber security uh, study. And uh, we pay money for them and uh, they need to uh, serve military for seven years. And uh, they are now on the field and they're doing their job. Also, many uh, universities, they have uh, cyber security and cyber defense courses. So we are now getting that, but uh, <clears throat> cyber security need many issues. We, the peoples, we need very talented, very selected uh, people, person, for the cyber attack and defense and security. But the older people need to understand how it is so uh, uh, the publics need to be educated, the quarantines and uh, how to, they wash their hands in cyber world they need to be very clean not to use the dirty uh, movies or oh, yeah. the illegal software download. That kind of uh, measure, they need to be, public need, need to be uh, educated. 
whole mixture of uh, the education, public education, and the very selective education, the mixture of both of them that will help us. Thank you very much uh, to the two of you for giving us a very comprehensive overview and some in-depth detail about uh, how South Korea is working with and addressing the cybersecurity threats and, and how you are uh, implementing the 5G and trying to encompass uh, security uh, instruments alongside. Um, and I think in the last 10 minutes, I think we got two areas of response that I haven't heard about before. And that is uh, the consumer aspect of, of cybersecurity and also what you said now, Janet Chi, about uh, cybersecurity hygiene, if I may say so, <laughs> that all of us can contribute to raise the bar for any kind of malicious actions in, I, in other natural um, grids. So thank you very much for this. This has been one in a series of 5G uh, lectures and seminars that ICP is organizing to raise awareness and also to learn from countries that is in the forefront of uh, 5G technology and cybersecurity like South Korea. So I'd like to thank you both very, very much for uh, joining us today and participating. And also like to thank our online viewers uh, for their questions. Thank you and hope to see you soon and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.